This is a wind turbine engineered from space age carbon fiber to see if it will bake cookies while we drive. Now, if you're wondering why anyone would bother to design, machine, 3D print, carbon fiber coat, and sand and polish all this when you can just buy a turbine off the internet and strap it to your car? Well, it's because I tried that already in videos one through three and it didn't work, like at all. That's because the small wind turbines you can buy are optimized for normal wind speeds and don't do well outside that range unless you make them adjustable for different wind speeds. But to do that, we need a mechanism that not only freely spins, but can also articulate while spinning. To make sure it's strong enough, we're using heavy steel bar stock, machining the basic shapes we need, then assembling them into what's called a weldment. It's not super precise, but that's okay because we're going to true it up in the mill afterwards. But always securely hold the workpiece or you might do something like this. Don't! That was an expensive tool and now it's garbage. Well, let's just learn from it and start over taking smaller bites. Dang it, another expensive tool. How about we borrow the chuck from the lathe and pin it down that way? Hey, that's better. What's this part for again? Oh yeah, a wind turbine. How about we hold it horizontally like it's going to be used? That'll make sure it's as accurate as possible. It doesn't wobble all over the place when it's spinning super fast. But this video is about wind power, not CNC machining. If you want more of that, check out my other channel, Build2, using the link in the video description. For now, we'll just verify everything fits together, then start designing the blades. The most common method for DIY wind turbine blades is cutting sections out of a tube. But how big should they be? How many should we use? And how much power will they make? The answer can be found using calculus, integrating lift and drag along the length of each blade. But fortunately, there's an easier way. Some undergrads at Technische Universität Berlin already developed open source software for this called Q-Blade. All we have to do is pick an airfoil shape, size, and RPM, then run the simulation. It graphs the expected performance as well as the thrust load on the rotor. Now we can tweak the blade geometry and run the simulation again. After a handful of iterations, we've got geometry predicting thousands of watts. But how are we supposed to get these blades out of the computer and into the real world? Well, Q-Blade can export three-dimensional XYZ points, which we can import into CAD. And after what's essentially a 3D game of connect the dots, we have a model we can use to finalize our hub design, and more importantly, export to a 3D printer. But even though we split the blade into sections small enough to fit the printer, the parts are still quite large, which often leads to issues with cracks and warping. I tried a garbage bag to keep the heat in, which helped, but ultimately decided to repurpose the heater from another appliance and mount it inside the printer. In hindsight, I should have mounted them outside and used the fan to blow the hot air in like a blow dryer, but the prints are way better, so for now, I'm just keeping an eye on it so it doesn't burst into flames. Now that the parts are all printed and getting glued together, it's time to start working on the electronics for the pitch control. I ordered this linear servo, and though it looks pretty small, it's spec to handle 80 newtons or 18 pounds of force. I've asked my lead programmer to set up an Arduino to control it with a PWM signal. A potentiometer signals the pitch we want, which shows up on the display. For testing, we've got a box fan blowing air at the blades, and I've challenged the kids to see what setting makes it spin the fastest. 
Granted, the pulley isn't driving anything, but it's pretty encouraging when a household fan is enough to move all that metal so quickly. But generating thousands of watts requires much tougher blades, so we're going to strengthen them with carbon fiber. After all, the largest jet engine in the world uses carbon fiber for its blades, so they've got to be good enough for our little project. But with no idea where to start, I searched online and found a company called Composite Envisions. They offer a variety of starter kits, so you don't forget that one part you need and have to halt your project. They also have a detailed article on carbon fiber techniques, which is super helpful. After a brief discussion with their engineer, we decided their vacuum bagging kit would be the best fit for my needs. I'll save the details for another video on my second channel, but in a nutshell, after using body filler and sanding to smooth the blades, we cut out layers of carbon fiber, soaked them with epoxy resin, wrapped them over the blades, followed by a bunch of other layers to handle extra resin, sandwich it between sheets of plastic, then suck all the air out to the lowest vacuum level you can get. I already had a cheap vacuum pump, but was concerned it might not survive hours and hours of continuous operation. So I went for the complete bagging system kit, which includes a high quality vacuum pump that's not going to die in the middle of a project. The kit even comes with a catch pot to protect the pump from any resin that might get sucked into the vacuum lines. Now the reason for pulling a vacuum on the bag is it allows Earth's atmospheric pressure to squeeze from every direction with nearly 15 pounds per square inch. This pushes any extra resin out of the carbon fiber, maximizing the fiber to weight ratio. After 24 hours, it's time to unwrap everything and start trimming the excess material. To protect the fibers, we're adding a couple layers of thick epoxy resin. It's messy, but after curing, can be sanded nice and smooth. Then it's time to spray on some 2K clear coat to protect from discoloration due to UV radiation. Think of it as sunscreen for your resin. The next step is totally unnecessary, but I'm choosing to wet sand with progressively finer and finer grit sandpaper, then finish it off with some polish for a clean, professional look. I was really nervous I'd mess up something major, but it turned out to be way more fun than I expected. If you want to try it yourself, maybe by dressing up the parts on your favorite ride, consider using Composite Envisions. Now the numbers say everything is way stronger than it needs to be, but I want to at least spin this up above operating speed before heading out on the road. So I'm throwing a belt on an old belt sander motor and plugging it into a variable transformer for speed control. I'm also having my son work on his soldering skills by firming up the wiring for the pitch control system. That'll allow us to precisely control the angle of the blades as we start to spin things up. All right, we're gonna give a small RPM test. Checking for vibration, got the high-speed camera running. Let's do this. I'm terrified, by the way. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> but my fear ensured I took things slow, stopping often to inspect and adjust. Also, I'm really glad I simulated things in the shop because it made it much easier to fix when this happened. Not sure what that, oh, I bet our, uh, I bet our pitch went. Oh, the bearings seized. Oh, man. Crud. So yeah, I used a fidget spinner bearing thinking the thing would be just fine handling the thrust load. But it was not. We'll fix it. We'll get another try. When the bearing seized, it snapped the plastic end off the actuator, which is a specialty part. Fortunately, I'm literally standing in a hobby machine shop. So in about 20 minutes, I whipped out a replacement and got us back in the game. But as we approached higher and higher RPMs, a slight imbalance in the weight of the two blades started to take its toll. Got some good shake to it. All right. Yeah, it's got a little more shake than I'd like to see. 
figure out how to balance that out. My solution was to add some threaded holes for different sized nuts and bolts, allowing us to bring the center of gravity closer to the axis of rotation. With that done, it's time to go for broke and see if we can hit a thousand RPM. 500. 600. 700. 8. Nine, nine fifty, oh, we made it. I think I might need to go clean out my... Now that we have a chance of actually producing thousands of watts, we need a load that can handle it. I asked my wife if I could borrow our oven, and she said, no, but you can have our oven. Hmm, I have a feeling a large appliance box might be appearing on my porch in a couple of days. With our load squared away and the pitch control installed, all that's left is to install the blades and take them for a spin. So strategy, I think I'll get up to speed, and then you can sit there and like I said, if you ferment it five degrees at a time, maybe. So do you think you need to back it back down to, oh, okay, yeah, that works. So we'll try 15 and see what we get. Woo, this way is on. drove around for hours but never got more than a few hundred watts. We couldn't help but wonder, was all this effort for nothing? Did the software give us false predictions? Do we need a flux capacitor? Something wasn't adding up. So later that night after the kids went to bed, I headed out alone to try to find some answers. I had a hunch our pitch indicator wasn't telling the truth and decided to try setting it at an obviously large angle and just drive for a bit to see if anything changed. Let's do it. Let's see what we get at 40. Why not? Okay, so it's supposedly set to 40. That is not, I don't know if you can see that. That is not, I mean, it's, that is not 40 degrees. It's actually gone past zero. So this thing is just pulling itself. It's, it's not a big enough actuator. I mean, we're, we're asking a lot of it. I didn't think the torsion on this thing would be all that much because it's acting about where the forces are supposed to be acting on the, on the blades. Uh, at least that's the way I understand it, but uh, yeah, we're just fully extending this little guy So uh, We can fix that. That's an easy problem. That's a mechanical problem. <laughs> I got this But though they make a larger version of that actuator, I need this working now So we're literally bolting the pitch mechanism in place with some threaded rod so it can't possibly move or so I thought. Yes. What? It is free to move yeah. because of this little pressed piece keeps coming out. So this yeah. was light duty. I think I, I underestimated the amount of forces that yeah, would be, be on, on this. Thing. Yeah, it, it was not like I just completely guessed it, but something about the drag or the way these things it, it's just putting way more torque on there and ripping the thing out so all right we will fix it we'll go back to the house but wait a sec that joint failed from the rod pulling out but if we reverse the mechanism we could make it push in instead 
That should work, but will it? All right, we've had uh, a number of challenges this morning. We had to flip some things around so that some press fit parts don't come apart. Cross your fingers that nothing else goes wrong. was pretty sweet. But without a remote actuator, that means we have to stop every time we want to make an adjustment. But we're so relieved to be finally getting results, we couldn't care less about having to pull over once in a while. I'll tell you if it peaks above 800. 834, 1.01 kilowatts. 1.21 gigawatts! <laughs> Yes! <laughs> 1.1 kilowatts! A thousand watts is pretty cool, but Qblade says we should be able to do far better. But I'm way past trying to predict the best blade position, and I'm leaving it completely up to my son. I don't know any more than you do, man. That seemed good? I'll just lock it down where you put it. Okay. All right. Looks good to me, man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I smacked you. <laughs> I never hit my children on purpose. <laughs> All right, let's get back on the road and see what this thing can do. rate that oven is heating, we should have no problem getting it up to temp. But clearly we didn't do all this just to bake cookies on the road. What I really want is to actually measure the effect this turbine has on fuel consumption. Unfortunately, as you may have noticed, the Bronco is not exactly stock. It's a resto mod I did myself with the guts of a newer F-150. Engine, transmission, everything that makes it go, and more. So there should be no problem monitoring real-time load on the engine with and without the turbine. But it would be a shame not to cook something, so if you have an idea, put it in the comments and we'll see what gets the most upvotes. Also, I promised a quick shout out to Laser Sterling, who's 3D printing a Lamborghini wrapped with carbon fiber but he's using vacuum infusion, which is even more involved than what I did, also sourcing his stuff from Composite Envisions. And of course, if you want to see how this story ends, be sure to like, subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video.